Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And a very warm welcome to worship this morning here at Lemberg and Greener. We welcome any visitors joining us for the first time, or those who are returning after the time away, or those who are joining us later on uh, through a recording of this morning's service. Unfortunately, because of some technical issues, we're unable to stream live this morning uh, because some equipment wasn't brought back in. Unfortunately, it's now all having to be reconfigured. So we'll get that dealt with after this morning's service. But whoever you are and whatever has brought you here, please know yourself to be most welcome. And we hope that you'll be able to continue our conversations and uh, getting to know one another over a cup of tea or coffee at the back of the church after worship this morning. Welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a couple of intimations for you. First of all, to let everyone know that tonight is our first in-person gathering of Cathy Church, which will take place here tonight at 6.30 p.m. in the, in, at the back here in Union Street, where we'll gather for tea and coffee, and we'll also have a chance to watch a short video, which is from a series called Numa. And Numa is the Greek word for spirit, and it's been uh, rejected uh, for the purposes of this series. And we're going to be looking at the theme of flame. Now, it's just by pure coincidence that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, and the theme of this is all about love. But we hope you'll be able to join us for this very interesting episode uh, where we'll get to watch the video and then talk about it and uh, have a little bit of a bit of time to chat about what we've learned in the video before we go our separate ways into the week. So that's at 6.30 until 7.30 tonight, and we hope that you'll come along and see what it's all about. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Can I also um, intimate that um, we're very grateful to Gateway, who have very kindly donated a sum of money to make it possible for the camera that has now been installed to allow people in the church, in the church to get to see a bit closer what's going on up here. And you get to see my ugly monkey glorious technical <laughs> process. But the camera will move with me, it's a, it's a moving camera, and it will move up to the pulpit and down to let us see what's going on with the young people. And it can even turn around and see you as well. So um, the faces will be protected to protect the innocent. However, we hope that uh, you'll be able to uh, enjoy that. And we're a grateful thanks to Gateway for this very generous donation to make all that possible. So thank you. perhaps we can thank them in the traditional fashion. Two further funerals for, um, for people from the church family. Um, first of all, um, the funeral of the late Jesse Langan, who used to attend um, along at Phoenix St Paul's back in the day. Um, well, her funeral takes place this Tuesday at 12 p.m. in uh, in Greener Crematorium, followed by a cup of tea at the Tontine. And our prayers are very much with uh, Jesse's uh, extended family at this time. And yesterday, I'm, I'm very sorry to announce, yesterday I was also informed that Alan Hyde has uh, unexpectedly passed away. Um, and uh, Kenny, his son, phoned me to let me know yesterday. Um, we have no funeral arrangements as of yet, obviously, because it's only just happened. But uh, Jeanette is keen for us to inform the church family of this sad news. And our prayers are very much with Jeanette and Kenny and Gillian and Susan and the wider circle of the family at this difficult time. And may they rest in peace and rise in glory. Our prayers are also with Jan Duffy's family following the passing of her father-in-law, Sir Robin, and um, our prayers are very much with their family as they prepare for the funeral service <coughs> next Saturday. And also um, the family of Alan Goodall, whose father passed away at the beginning of this week as well. And our prayers are very much with all of these families who are dealing with loss at this difficult time. May they all rest in peace and rise in glory. Today we continue our journey through the journey of the Gospel of Luke, where we are coming on to a passage which may not be familiar to many of you, but in some ways very familiar. Many of us have heard of the Beatitudes, where Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, said, Blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the earth, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, today, we're going to be reading Luke's Beatitudes. 
And when you put them side by side, you can see why Matthew's Beatitudes are perhaps maybe a bit more popular. But we're going to look at why and how they speak to us and what our inheritance are as God's people. But for now, allow me to open our service with this call to worship. Gather not in order of rank, title or wealth, but blessed by the God for whom all are equal. Gather not because we are special or live life for sake free, but blessed by the God for whom all are equal. Touch today by the Spirit of God, whether here in person or remote worship, blessed by the God for whom all are equal. Friends, let us worship God and sing to his praise in the first hymn that we sing together. We join to sing to the Eriske Love Lilt, Lord of Life, we come to you. Hymn number 782 of the Church Hymn. Whose is not. 
Thy touch has still its ancient power. No word from thee can fruitless fall. Here in this solemn sacred hour, and in thy mercy, heal us all. Heal us and hear as we pray, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, who taught his disciples when praying to say the words which we now say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's wonderful to see you all, and it's great to see some young people here, despite it being a half-term holiday, and it's great that you've all been here. Can I ask if there are any young ones here? Perhaps they can come forward because I need your help with a little task. If you come up and see me in front, that'd be okay. You coming to see me? I don't bite, I've had my breakfast. <laughs> no, not happening today. Right, okay, don't worry, I'll come to you. Are you coming to me? Oh, thanks, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, we're in a bubble, so I can see last one here, so that's quite good. Right. <laughs> Hands up if you remember the game show The Price is Right. Quite a few of you. Right. We are going to have a game of The Price is Right. And we're going to see how you get on with these items. The first item in Johnny's Price is Right is a PlayStation 5. The one with the disk drive, not the network version. So the dearer one. Holly, how much do you think a PS5 costs? 600 pounds. 600 pounds? Hands up for higher. A few. Hands up for lower. Hands up, you haven't got a bloody clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> a PS5, a PlayStation 5 is a games console that was made in 2020 by Sony, sold out very quickly, and a lot of people were on a waiting list for Christmas. So as you can imagine, it was a very much coveted item. Holly said 600. Some of you said higher. Some of you said lower. The answer is 400. The next item, now you'll love this one, the next item is a car. This is no ordinary car, it's not Marks and Spencer's car either, it is a Tesla C Model 3. Okay, now this is the one that's a bit more readily available in the UK market, it's the sort of the entry level Tesla. Still expensive, has a range of about 250 to 335 miles, and you'll see a lot of them trickling around in Berkeley. Holly, how much do you think a Model 3 Tesla costs? How much? A thousand pounds. I blooming wish. <laughs> right. I might be going to try the lower. Hands up if you think it's higher. About £40,000 higher. <laughs> now, Alan in the motor industry might be able to tell me that I understand that it's £40,990 for a Tesla Model 3. Which is, that's the entry level one. It's a bit like BMWs back in the 80s, we get to pay extra for indicators in a radio cassette player. <laughs> anyway. That is a lot of potential. So forty-one thousand pounds. That's a lot of money. The last one. Then, oh, let's see if you have any better luck with this one. A standard forty-five gram bar of Cadbury's dairy milk. <laughs> Holly, how much do you think for just a normal, not a big bar, a normal one that you would buy in Halls, for instance? How much would that cost? I 
Zwei <lacht> Fremde. Okay. Hands up for the Lord. <laughs> Sorry, darling. No one thinks higher than five pounds, do they? No. I know the food prices are going up, but it's not that bad, Jay. The answer is, by an average across the supermarkets, having checked this morning, approximately 69 pence. 69 pence for a 45 gram bar of dairy milk. Holly, you are going to be spared any further embarrassment. You can have <laughs> seen. Let's give Holly a wee clap. <laughs> So, as we know, all these things, I'm just going to check my prices here actually, hang on a minute, let me see if we're that right. £159, £159, £69, right, that's good, excellent. So, people put a price on things, don't they? And some people see things to be more expensive than they are, some people see them to be cheaper than they are, and some people just know what they're worth. And that's what it's like in life, isn't it? Where people put a price on things and put things in a, in a sort of a, a, in a, in a sort of an order as to what is more important, what's more precious, what's more what's more expensive, what's dearer than other things. And some people have a, quite a mixed up view of what is important in life. And that is what happens in today's Bible story. Because Jesus comes into the towns, having been on the mountain and called his disciples, called his apostles actually, out of all of his disciples. And comes down into the towns, of Tyre and Sip and Sidon and various places, and everyone is clamouring over one another to get to hear what Jesus has got to tell them. And they're all wanting to reach out and touch him because he's healing people and driving out evil spirits in the town. Everyone thinks if they go out and touch Jesus, everything will be sorted and they won't need to worry about another thing. But obviously Jesus has seen this happening and he goes, wait a minute, I'm not going to be here every day. So if people come to me looking to be healed tomorrow and I'm not here, they're going to think that they're less important than the people that are here that day today. So Jesus decides, it's time, I need to set the record straight. And Jesus reminds us in this series of blessings, all these things, he says to us, look, God is just as interested, in fact, sometimes more interested, if you don't have lots of money and a high-flying job and everything being wonderful in your life. I don't care any more about them than people who are struggling, who have no money, who are really struggling just now for varieties of for a variety of reasons. They are really special to me, these people, and they will be rewarded in heaven. If you think that having money and success just now is all there is to it, and that means that you're better than other people, then you've got it wrong. Because you're no more special and no more blessed in my eyes than those who go without. In fact, he says to the disciples, he's, to, he's saying this to all of his disciples and other people that are overhearing him. And what he actually goes on to say is, do you know, when you follow me, it's actually not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. Do you remember last week when I asked the young people about what they sort of think about before they join a group or a club, where they go and actually find out what the club offers and what sort of things you'll do and what sort of things you'll achieve? And Jesus only tells the disciples, or tells the fishermen, come with me and I'll teach you to catch people. And that was all they were told, and yet they left everything and followed. Well, today it's a bit like Jesus is saying, you know how I told you to catch people? Well, I didn't actually kind of tell you there's kind of a few risks involved with this. Some people are not going to like what you've got to say. Some people are going to be quite horrible to you. 
And sometimes you're going to have to go without things. But please be assured that what goes on in this world is not all there is to it. There are more amazing things to follow. And God promises us, Jesus promises us, that those who follow him and believe in him will have the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of eternal life. And that was made possible because the greatest price of all was paid by Jesus himself. Today, we are thinking about this, and tomorrow, it's another special day for some, Valentine's Day. And some of you might be writing cards and sending presents, maybe anonymous presents. A bunch of flowers, boxes of chocolates. But do you know, some of some spouses are nudging one another and saying, are you listening by the way? <laughs> I remember when I was driving to do a church service a few years ago, I was listening to the radio and the wonderful old classic, My Funny Valentine, came on the radio. And it finished with a line which completely changed my all-age talk, which is not a good thing when you're a student and you're as nervous as sin. And it was that line at the end where it said, each day is Valentine's Day. Because we don't stop loving people the next day after Valentine's Day. It's like, right, that's it, 12 o'clock, that's it, expired, here's the flowers back. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. But it's the same with God's love. God's love never changes. And the love which Jesus demonstrates and shows us never expires. Because each day is Valentine's Day with God. Because God, Jesus, loves us each and every minute of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. And for me, that is the greatest gift of all. We're going to sing a song now, which was originally written with the hands up if you've ever been to Disneyland. How many of you have still got the song It's a Small World in your head? <laughs> Quite a few of you. Well, you would please to hear we're not singing to that tune today. But the words that we're going to be singing are based very much on the words of this is, it's a small world after all. It's a, call, it's a song called This is God's World After All, written by a good friend of mine, the Reverend Ian Cunningham from Kirkton Parish Church in Kirkwood, who has written many hymns in the church community. And because of copyright, necessity is the mother of invention, he had to write another tune to it. So we're going to sing this version of It's, this is God's World After All, and it's called It's a World of Sunshine. Let's join and sing together. <coughs> Yeah. 
And thank you very much, Frank, for coming on in a holiday weekend. It's great to have you with us, and we look forward to seeing you after the service. All right, see you soon. I think Colleen is saying that she's going to be in the same team today, <laughs> which I think they're very grateful for as well. So let us listen for the gospel of the Lord as we read from Luke's gospel, chapter 6, where we're going to be reading verses 16, 17 sorry, to 26. And I'll be reading this morning from the message version. Coming down off the mountain with them, he stood on a plain surrounded by disciples and was soon joined by a huge congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem, even from the seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon. They had come both to hear him and to be cured of their ailments. Those disturbed by evil spirits were healed. Everyone was trying to touch him. So much energy surging from him, so many people healed. Then he spoke, you're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out. Every time someone sneers or blackens your name to discredit me, what it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and that the person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens, skip like a lamb if you like, but even though they don't like it, I do, and all heaven applauds. I know that you're in good company, my creatures and witnesses have always been treated like this. But it's trouble ahead if you think you have made and you haven't made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met. And you're going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scandal preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. Amen, and thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. For this time of reflection, allow me to read these words of an alternative set of Beatitudes written by Nadia Boltzweiler. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are they who doubt. Those who aren't sure, who can still be surprised. Blessed are they who are spiritually impoverished and therefore not so certain about everything that they no longer take in new information. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who have Bidding their loved ones for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who have loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are the mothers of the miscarried. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. 
Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kids who sit alone at school lunch tables. The laundry workers at the hospital. The sex workers and the night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the teens who have to figure out ways to hide the new cuts in their arms. Blessed are the weak. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard, for Jesus chose to surround himself with people like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are the ones without lobbyists. Blessed are foster kids and kids with additional support needs, and every other kid who just wants to feel safe and loved. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burnt out social workers and the overworked teachers and legal aid lawyers. Blessed are the kind hearted football players and the fundraising trophy winners. Blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed are they who hear that they are forgiven. Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally negated. Friends, we're going to continue our worship in the singing of our next hymn. And this one is to a tune, a, a very old but familiar tune to many, old, which is it's a tune called Standing on the Promises. I'm hoping that there's not too many void faces out there. You'll probably pick it up when, when we pick up when we get on. This is written by Carolyn, Carolyn McFidulet, and it's entitled Blessed Are the Poor Among You. I should play it through once and I'll play it on the other way.
able to find some decent tennis for this Bible passage. <laughs> Let us pray. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God, be in our hearts and in our listening. Amen. <clears throat> so as I said earlier, some of you may have listened to this passage of Luke's Gospel and thought to yourself, now hang on a minute, that's not what they sound like. For some of you will have recalled Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. But today we are reading Luke's presentation of much of the same material in what is known by many as the Sermon on the Plain. And it's difficult to know whether this is the same sermon described in two different ways by two different writers, or whether Jesus had a few sermons tucked up his sleeve that he delivered more than once. If this was a sermon Jesus preached more than once, if he preached it on a mountain and on another occasion on a plain, then that might also explain the addition in Luke of some woes that correspond to the Beatitudes, woes that Matthew never included. As is always the case when reading scripture by means of a reading pattern such as the lecture that when we do, then it's always important to look at the context as well as the text itself. It's always important to look at the text that surrounds the chosen passages for a Sunday to fully understand what's going on. So what's going on in the run-up to today's reading? Well, people are coming to Jesus in significant numbers and everyone's trying to touch him in the hope of being able to tap into Jesus' energy as it flows out of him in his acts of healing and driving out demons. One commentator shares the story of Robert F. Kennedy, who during his 1968 presidential race had people coming from far and wide to touch Bobby. People close to Bobby would recount that Kennedy's arms and hands would be bloodied with scratches and his shirt collar cuffs would be absolutely shredded to smithereens because people, wherever he went, would form this small sea of outstretched hands wherever he went, all wanting to touch Bobby and feed off his positive energy and the hope he was giving. Now the time in which these events were taking place, it was a tough time. People wanted change. People wanted hope. People wanted a new way. Sound familiar? Everyone wanted healing. Everyone wanted a peace of the man who held out the promise of a better tomorrow. And many were healed, but not all. Many were changed, but not all. Whatever the kingdom of God is for this present time, it's not a ticket to a charmed life in which every believer will be kept free of pain or disease or disappointment or even persecution. But before I go forward, I want to knit back even further to what happens just before what you could describe as the Helathon. At verse 12 we read, At about that same time Jesus climbed the mountain to pray. He was there all night in prayer before God. The next day he summoned his disciples. From them he selected twelve he designated as apostles. And with those twelve by his side, he came down the mountain and continued his ministry. He took twelve different ordinary people and went on to change the world forever. And friends, I believe the same can happen here and now. Jesus can and Jesus has called us 
and continues to call us. A gathering of ordinary people with different gifts and different ideas and different views and together we can play a part in changing this broken, hurting world for the better. I genuinely believe that. So Jesus is called his 12 disciples. They come down the mountain and Jesus goes on to teach, to cure disease, to drive out evil spirits. Everyone is trying to touch him. Energy is surging from Jesus and countless people are being healed. It must have been an amazing sight. It must have been an amazing atmosphere. But it's not always going to be that way. It can't always be this way. It's not as straightforward as that. And so right in the middle of all this excitement, all this rabble, Jesus stops. He turns to his disciples and begins to tell them exactly what they've signed up for. Continuing from what I was telling the young ones last week, Jesus today goes on to share the terms and conditions. And he does so by sharing this series of the attitudes, a series of blessings which detail a lifestyle and a mindset that was all but completely at odds with what most people were at that very moment seeking to get from Jesus. Could you imagine if somebody elected as president or as the leader of a country stood up to give a victory speech and went down the road that Jesus did? Could you imagine the response? Could you imagine the reaction? <coughs> victory speeches are all about shooting to the moon. It's all about giving hope and promises that can't always be given, they always be kept. It's about positivity and joy and, and, and aiming for that high goal. But Jesus doesn't go down that road. Instead, he gives these blessings. And these are not blessings and curses in the sense of powerful divine commands or magical words which will change the course of a person's life. They're profound observations about how things are from the perspective of the kingdom, very different from how they appear on the surface. The fact that Matthew omits those woes while expanding and spiritualizing the blessing suggested that Luke's is the earlier account. It would appear that Luke's was written before Matthew. And Matthew's chosen to treat it accordingly. But Luke has Jesus address his words of comfort to those who are literally poor and hungry. Whereas Matthew focuses on those who are poor in spirit or those who hunger for righteousness. They are agreed in the blessings stored up for those who grieve and those who are persecuted for the faith. But Luke has a greater emphasis on the reversal of fortunes that the establishment of the kingdom will bring. Those who weep now will not only be comforted, but will laugh. Victims of persecution will not only have a stake in the kingdom, but will receive a great reward. Luke's four maledictions bring the focus back sharply to the political and economic realm. Those who are rich, well-fed, contented and of high status should enjoy the good fortune while they can, because it's not going to last. In the coming kingdom, the tables will be turned and they will find out what it's like for those whom they currently exploit and ignore. A notion that is entirely consistent with the thrust of Luke's gospel from beginning to end and echoes what we heard Jesus announcing just a couple of weeks ago when he identifies himself as the one who will bring good news to the poor in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Today, Jesus presents us with a vision of the kingdom which involves a complete overturning not only of what the average person now as much as then would assume to be signs of God's favour, but also of what most conventional religious, religious teaching, from the psalmists to the TV evangelists, has asserted. 
is challenging that idea of a prosperity gospel and exposing it for the untruth that it is. It's challenging that view that prosperity is a sign of God's blessing, which does exist as it does in the book of Job. But those views are few and far between, and it's no wonder that people who have been shortchanged by preachers failing to grasp the radical nature of Jesus' teaching still find their faith crumbling when bad things happen to them or their loved ones, and they assume that they must have a favour with God. That's not how it works. It never has, and it never will. Jesus' message, whether it's been heard by the first century Christian community for whom this gospel was written, or to people like ourselves in the far distant future, this message depends entirely on which set of descriptions fit us best. If we are poor, hungry, marginalised and excluded from power, then God's promised blessings are already ours. We can walk taller, we can hold our heads higher, and we can wait confidently for the positive changes which the kingdom will bring. If we are wealthy, privileged, and powerful, however, Jesus' words whiz noisily across the plain and down the centuries, a bit like the howlers in the Harry Potter books. And these words should still make us sit up and pay attention to what Jesus is calling us to do. For Jesus is challenging us to make necessary changes in our lives now. If we want to be part of the new world order which the kingdom represents. We may bless the poor and the hungry and celebrate that in the kingdom they will be taken care of and fed. But as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot hear about that future provision without recognising its present tense implication for how we live right now. We cannot and must not kick back and ignore the poor and hungry now on account of their being taken care of later, as we read in John Lindo's Gospel. Rather than Jesus' name, we as his disciples should be caring for them here and now, instantiating at best, we, as best we can, kingdom patterns in this present moment. It's not all about saying God will look after them later on. We are called to play our part in taking care of those who are disenfranchised here and now. Yes, these Beatitudes have a definite future component, but they impinge directly on today as well. So as we go on to enjoy a chat over coffee after the service, as we go about life this week as individuals and as part of this church family, ask yourself, what kingdom work can we be playing our part in? What can we do to tend to the needs of the poor and the hungry, to the excluded and the disenfranchised? What can we do to be a blessing to those whom Jesus blesses? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. And all God's people say, Amen. <coughs> Friends, we continue our worship in the singing of our next hymn. We're going to sing hymn number 252 from the Church Trinity, As a Fire is Meant for Burning.
they come before God with our prayers for others and indeed ourselves in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Wise and generous God, we take time today to do as the old hymn suggests and count our blessings, naming them silently one by one and giving thanks to you, the source of all that is good and of the deep down happiness for which we long. We give thanks for the obvious blessings, never to be taken for granted, for good health when we have it, and access to medical care, for food in our bellies and a safe place to live, for people who care about us and for whom we can care, for freedom to dress and speak and worship and love as we choose, without fear of persecution. But we are grateful also for the curious blessings recognized as such only with hindsight, for losses that help us see what really matters, for vulnerability that enables us to reach out in love, for our weakness that forces us to depend on you, for brushes with death that have helped us value life more. Loving God, you want all your children to live lives that are full and worthwhile. And we pray for those for whom each day is a struggle to survive, never mind to thrive. For those who are trapped in poverty and cannot see that ever changing. Those who so not, those who do not have enough to eat. Those who overeat to bury their unhappiness. Those who are shamed and humiliated for being who they are. And those who do the shame. God of justice and mercy, there is so much that is wrong with our world, which is also your world. We long for the coming of the kingdom that Jesus talked about so much, and by whose standards he lived his life on earth, giving in order to receive, letting go in order to find, dying in order to live. Not lightly, but as honestly as we can, we pray for that kingdom to come, knowing that if our prayer were to be answered, it might cost us dearly. Grant us your blessing, we pray, and enjoy the chaotic turmoil that ensues as we discover exactly what that means. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Friends, can I thank you once again for braving the elements to be with us here this morning and my great thanks also to John leading us in our music this morning as well as Adrian and Alan and for about Holly on our live streaming. And apologies once more to those who are watching in playback but we will have the gadgetary fixed by next Sunday. We close our service here before we go into fellowship over tea and coffee with our closing hymn. We're joined to sing, when to our world the Saviour came.
that you walk in God's way. And may the blessing of God be with you today and every day. Amen. Friends, may we go now in peace.